Okay, we have it on this screen. And there we go. All right. Well, thank you for uh, staying awake. Uh, see if I can cure that here late in the afternoon after wonderful food. Thank you, Gary. In fact, before I started, I would like to join the others in thanking Garrick for uh, having put this amazing thing together. Uh, I, I'm not sure the degree to which we should give all the thanks to Garrick. Um, it's it's a, a somewhat a miracle that it actually works. Garrick just sort of throws it all in there and everybody sort of picks up a piece and runs with it and somehow it all works out uh, just right. Uh, but thank you very much, Gary. And, and one of the magical pieces that uh, Garrick knows uh, is an essential ingredient in having Starmus really work is our friend here in the front row, Ryan May, uh, who has uh, contacts with all of the wonderful musicians in the world uh, who put on that absolutely fantastic performance last night and that that is uh, I mean compared with what Jerry was just talking about you don't have as quite as many people but uh, pulling that together and, and doing that incredible very personal committed performance was just uh, wonderful thank you so much Brian And finally, before I, I really get started, I'd like to, to uh, add my thanks, and I'd like all of us to add our thanks to all of the people who are in the back rooms who we don't see, but who make this thing work. They don't get much credit, uh, but it's all of the support people here uh, in Zurich that are put together that make this work. So let's thank all those other people. So my, the uh, subject that I want to talk about here is what I believe to be the real significance of Apollo. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about my Apollo 9 flight. Um, if you really want to know much about that, uh, God's Dictionary or God's Encyclopedia called Wikipedia is readily available to everyone. Um, but what I really want to do is put Apollo in, in context. Um, toward the end of last year, anticipating this 50th anniversary um, year of celebrations, in fact it's going to be multiple years of celebrations, the uh, 50th anniversaries will go uh, on for quite a while, and uh, knowing that there would be hundreds, if not thousands, of such celebrations uh, all over, not just the United States, but here in Europe and, and other places around the world, frankly. Um, I asked myself toward the end of, of last year, what, what did I want to, uh, what did I want to say about Apollo? Now, my orientation is a bit philosophical. Um, I'm very interested in the other aspects, by the way, of Starmus. Uh, I track all the gravity waves that have been detected lately. I'm friends with all the people that are going to be speaking with you in the next several days as well. Uh, these are very interesting things to me. And all of this fits in a context that, uh, that I want to uh, superpose Apollo on top of and uh, to try and give us a, a, uh, an understanding of what this really means. Now this is a very personal statement. Uh, I'm going to tell you what it means to me. I hope that you're able to play with it, to work with it, and to make something of it even more than, than what I have. But uh, in looking at the significance of Apollo, the questions I said was what, what was the real meaning, what was realize what was made real uh, in Apollo. Now the historical context that I superpose Apollo on to get some idea of what the real significance was is the biggest picture that's imaginable. 
uh, from the left, the Big Bang, moving across time to the right, to the evolution of the universe as we see it today, and uh, represented on the far right uh, by the thinker. That incredible progression from 17 billion years ago, uh, starting out with uh, quantum particles, uh, finally cooling, uh, actually very rapidly cooling, and expanding to form subatomic particles, the first atoms, uh, hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, coming together to form the first stars, which then added to the panoply of, of uh, element atomic uh, species uh, as they uh, rapidly grew and exploded, uh, moving into uh, uh, the first molecules, the first complex molecules with heavier elements, uh, what are called metals by the astrophysicists, uh, being created in those first exploding stars. That evolution from atomic physics then into molecular physics, molecular chemistry, and into chemistry. We, we end up with complex molecules as we go out to the right forming and uh, clouds, uh, dark clouds which form uh, uh, more mature planets, planets uh, or stellar systems much more like our sun, uh, which is a relatively recent five billion year old object uh, about which we orbit. Um, the magical time, a very magical time in this progression from left to right was that transition. Each, each of these transitions superposes on those before it. Those still exist, uh, whether it's quantum physics or uh, the early elements, uh, but superposed then on the, uh, on the existence and the development of chemistry at some point, which we don't really understand, came biology. That transition that added biology to this evolutionary process really is an amazing thing when you think about it because once biology emerged in this evolutionary process, the whole idea of intentionality came into being. Every biological system has an intention and in fact a drive to survive. It's a fundamental piece of all biology. And as biology evolved and became more complex and began self-organizing, uh, in fact, that biology, including us, began to manipulate the rest of material in order to form tools and machines. And the machines that we, as humans, have created uh, have enabled us to in some sense evolve at a much, much greater and more rapid pace. Now I want to take just a moment to pay tribute to one of the most amazing machines that has ever been created, and that is the gravitational wave detectors. Uh, we have been talking about Apollo, and, and I have a great appreciation for the incredible creativity and inventiveness uh, represented in, in rocket technology, rocket science. I am a rocket scientist. And, uh, but let me just make a couple of statements just to throw out a little bit of the awe associated with the machines which we, with which we have partnered to understand this history, this complex history of life. Uh, the LIGO uh, machines have a f two four kilometer tracks about down which a pulse of laser light races and races back and uh, that laser projection allows the astrophysicists to actually measure the length of that four kilometer uh, track very precisely between the mirrors at each end and the gravitational waves from merging black holes emerging neutron stars, or combinations thereof, uh, literally caused, uh, according to the Einsteinian theory 100, developed 100 years ago, uh, waves propagating through space and time at the speed of light, and as they pass the Earth, space and time itself oscillates. But to, to understand and detect that oscillation, those 
four kilometer long measuring sticks have to be measured, their length has to be measured extremely precisely. How precisely? These, these machines are so precise that they can measure the change of length of a four kilometer ruler, if you will, to, the, to one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Now, that is, I can hardly even say that. That is so unbelievable that you can measure a change of length, the dimension of one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. If you take that four kilometers and you make that the distance between Earth and the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, then that one ten thousandth of, a, of the diameter of a proton is about the width of a human hair. That's the kind of accuracy that we now make machines. This is absolutely incredible. We have partnered with those machines in order to expand our capability and in the case of Apollo and putting that now in context, um, it is that ability to partner with the machines we make that allow us to move out from the Earth. Um, that was first evident, in my view, with Apollo 8. Now the Apollo 8 mission that flew around Christmas time in uh, December of uh, 1968, Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders went out to the moon. Uh, I'm going to use this as their spacecraft. Uh, when Bill and, uh, and his partners got to the moon, uh, Frank Borman put the, uh, the spacecraft, the pointy end down, if you will. Remember, he had only the command and service module. There was no lunar module until our Apollo 9 mission. But they went out to the moon with the command and service module, and the pointy end, uh, they flew it down as they went around the moon, so that the pointy end was always pointing at the surface of the moon. And if you think of this uh, label as the windows, and that it was moving across the moon surface, I, I guess I can move, come to think of it, uh, it was moving across the moon surface this way, their windows were actually pointed backward for the first three orbits that they went around the moon so that as they went around the moon looking out their windows they would see crater after crater after crater appearing below them as you see here and moving off toward the far horizon as they went around the moon and the three of them went around the moon looking at these craters to gain some information for later missions when we would need to understand everything possible about uh, the craters which might form obstacles or opportunities uh, for those later missions um, but as Bill Anders said, when you go around the moon like that, looking at thousands of craters, one after the other, craters on top of craters, uh, uh, it all gets rather boring. Uh, you know, they're all uh, shades of gray. There's no color that you can see from orbit. Uh, the sky is black, pitch black, uh, and they go around this way, seeing crater after crater. After the third orbit, Frank Borman rotated the spacecraft still pointy end down, but now the windows were looking forward and they were picking up craters coming over the far horizon and passing under them as they went. And shortly after they did this, they were shocked, surprised and literally shocked, because over the horizon, with no expectation on their part, came planet Earth. And to me, it is this moment when the three of those guys saw this Earthrise, classic, iconic Earthrise uh, image that all of us, humankind, that we suddenly realized, we became very aware that all of life, everything else that you can see in the universe is shades of black, black and white, whether it's stars, the desiccated surface of the moon or whatever, and then over the horizon comes this brilliant, beautiful, blue and white planet on which all of the life that we know exists. We don't know of any other life. Suddenly, that home planet becomes something uh, deep inside. There is an identification there which is phenomenal. All of, all of everything that we know can be covered up you know, by your thumb. Uh, 
that was a very special moment uh, in, it seems to be, our understanding of what this was all about, what it was we were doing. Two and a half months later, I was flying on Apollo 9. And this is a shot, one of the very few shots of me on the outside of the spacecraft. I'm on the, I've got my feet uh, in some restraints on the front porch of the lunar module. And uh, you can see the reflection of the, of the uh, Earth in my visor. And um, the handrail on the front of the lunar module and then turning uh, 90 degrees and coming uh, toward the bottom of the picture there was a handrail which would allow us, if we had to, uh, something wrong with the tunnel uh, that we couldn't get back into the command module and our heat shield, which was pretty important, uh, that we could perhaps go uh, externally across that handrail to the command module. And the next, and one of the tasks I had was to demonstrate that capability by going hand over hand up the handrail. Now this morning you, you, you heard Chris uh, Hadfield give a, a wonderful description of extravehicular activity. And I had the great privilege of testing the, uh, the brand new Apollo suit, which you see here, the, which was made by uh, uh, International Latex Corporation. Um, and it was a wonderful suit. It was, it was just great. Um, uh, and nevertheless, we had to demonstrate that I could move up the handrails and, and uh, control my body so that I wouldn't flop around and either break antennas or poke holes in my suit by the antennas. There was no question that I would be able to do that, but we had to demonstrate it and prove it. And Dave Scott, uh, who took this photograph, this still photograph, had a movie camera, and he was, uh, his job was to take uh, photographs or uh, movies of me as I came up along that handrail. I got about uh, three feet up to that handrail uh, to that position. This is a picture taken from inside the lunar module by Jim McDivitt, who was our commander. Um, and I got to that point, uh, both hands on the handrail, when Dave said, oh, the movie camera just jammed. And Dave said, knowing that we really needed to get the documentary film, he said, OK, Dave, uh, you got five minutes to try and get the camera working again. Rusty, stay right there. <laughs> Great words. I was almost literally fired in space. I had no job to do for five minutes. I heartily, re I heartily recommend unemployment from time to time. <laughs> this was an ideal moment. Impulsively, for no particularly I didn't think about it, of course I didn't know the camera was going to jam anyway, but impulsively I said to myself, okay, I'm, I'm going to shed my astronaut persona, I've got five minutes, I'm just going to be a human being. So I let go with my right hand and I just swung around as you see here with my left hand uh, holding lightly on the handrail. Nobody was talking, when nobody was talking, the radio was completely off. It wasn't just silent, it was off because it was a voice-operated uh, type of radio. So it was totally silent. Dave was busy, Jim was, I guess, busy, or at least he wasn't talking. Um, as I was hanging there, when you're in the spacesuit, Chris gave you some idea of what it feels like to be in a spacesuit in space. One of the things Chris didn't really say very much was that if you're not moving, which, at once I rotated around and looked at the beautiful earth there, I was just hanging. The suit is floating, and you're like a pea in a pod floating inside the suit. You're not even aware you have the suit on. You're, you're, if you're touching the edge of, this, of the inside of the suit, you don't even really feel it. You just sort of end up in the middle of, the, of that human-shaped suit, and you're hanging there. The visor on the Apollo suit was uh, had no obstructions all the way to the back where it was the only solid piece. The rest of it was all transparent and even though I had a gold coat coating on it, there was nothing that blocked my view. So that you're really hanging there in space looking at this, as Chris said this morning, this incredibly beautiful planet where everything that means anything to you is on that planet below and you get a little bit of a picture of it on the lower left-hand corner, but um, you've seen the horizon and other pictures that people have shown today. The, the awareness of 
not only this, the beauty and the contrast between this planet and the blackness of space, but that very bright, brilliant, blue, thin horizon all the way around the edge of the planet, you're immediately aware that that atmosphere is what sustains life on this planet. Unasked, uninvited, and again a surprise, all suddenly a whole bunch of questions came in. What, how did I get here? Why am I here? What, is, what does this mean? When I say I, am I me or am I us? These were not the simple questions uh, answered by, you know, a Saturn V rocket or the American taxpayer. This is, humankind has evolved to the point where, in partnership with our machines, we are able now to move outward from planet Earth. And that, that's what's happening at this moment in history. Life is emerging from planet Earth. Very shortly after this time, uh, a wonderful, wonderful man, uh, whom many of you, I'm sure, have read, uh, uh, came up with, uh, Jim Lovelock came up with the Gaia hypothesis, became called the Gaia hypothesis. Uh, Jim realized as a biologist that there was a tremendous amount of unappreciated communication between all of the different life forms of Earth. Trees, we know, communicate with one another and they shape each other's behavior over significant distances. In fact, the whole planet, in many ways, being a living entity, communicates and actually changes the environment, the evolutionary environment of the planet itself, which has then shaped and enabled us to evolve. Without pressing an analogy too far, let me just say that there are parallels which I began to see and understand in the several years after this experience as I, as I thought more and more about these questions that came flooding into me. I realized that I, that I was simply a representative of humanity up there. This is not Rusty Schweikart, a farm kid who somehow earned this privilege. I'm just a representative of life. I'm, I was, I saw myself almost as a sensing element as life begins to move outward. And part of my responsibility in that was to bring this experience back uh, to people. But as I thought more and more about it, I realized that there is a tremendous parallel. Uh, again, I don't want to press it too far, but I began to see this as this moment in history as cosmic birth. If you think about human birth, the fetus, of course, is totally dependent upon the mother for sustenance and for growth and for processing of waste. And yet, as the fetus grows, the demand for more and more energy and sustenance to continue that growth, that evolutionary process of growing, and the need to process greater and greater amounts of waste products, which are a part of that process, begins to stress the capability of the mother to the point where it triggers what we call the birthing process. And that birthing process is actually quite violent. Contractions, of course, are what we call the, the primary uh, uh, manifestation of that process. But then out through the birth canal comes this totally new life with the full potential of a new life. And if we think about the earth and the, and the stresses that we put on as we are, as a life form, as a, as a species, as life itself is growing on the earth and the demand for resources, there are parallels there which are very interesting. And we see those contractions as well in the form of migration and stresses and strains of, of many kinds. But we're moving out and that that moment of cosmic birth, it seems to me, is what we're, what it is we're experiencing. Now, that process of human birth, I'll just go to the human birth, and again, not to press it too far, but it is after birth that that one-way relationship of the mother supporting the fetus now becomes and evolves into a two-way relationship. In fact, it becomes a love relationship 
And right behind love comes responsibility. And in the same sense that the environmental movement was tremendously energized by this experience of Apollo and, and moving out, looking at the Earth from deep space. Um, this, this then was followed by what I believe is our responsibility collectively, but individuals I think are worth calling attention to. In the upper left you have one of the early concepts of space colonies that was developed by Professor uh, Gerard O'Neill from Princeton University and many of you will, re will recall those days of, of the space colony concept. Um, and Jerry O'Neill's idea has now been picked up by Jeff Bezos, for example, and competing with Jeff for getting things done is the man on the upper right who we just honored uh, last night, Elon Musk. And by the way, let me just say that Elon Musk uh, had a very successful launch today with, with the Falcon Heavy. Um, uh, it, it was completely successful mission. It was the most demanding uh, launch sequence that has ever been done. Uh, the, the launch vehicle actually had to drop off numerous satellites into three different orbits all on one launch. And they were all completed successfully. And in addition to that, he recovered the two outside uh, boosters. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the core uh, did not land successfully on the barge. Uh, it ended up in the ocean, but that's okay. You know, close enough for non-government work as well as government work. Uh, and he's done that before, so I mean, uh, you know, that that'll get straightened out. But in any case, this is this is a, an example of, and out of the experience that I've been talking about here, this is an example of assuming responsibility for this evolutionary process. And these two men, and many, many others, but in particular people who have a lot of money and a lot of capability, are now investing in this movement, this, in this continued evolution of life out from Earth. Uh, Elon talks about it openly in the form of becoming humanity, becoming a multi-planet species. This is something which probably started who knows how far back, but certainly Copernicus. You can go back a few hundred years, and that's still, cosmically speaking, just a moment in time, the present moment. But from Copernicus through Galileo and, and, and others, perhaps through Jules Verne, uh, to the present day, humanity has been fascinated by the stars and the sense of we belong out there and we're curious about are we alone in this universe? I mean, these things are deeply embedded in life as we 